We'll start from verse 1, Exodus chapter 32. <coughs> when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has come of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and worship it and sacrifice to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with your mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them on, off the face of the earth? Turn from your burning wrath and anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you bore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his back, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as, he, as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of cry for defeat but the sound of singing that I hear and as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing Moses anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain he took the calf that he had made that they had made and burnt it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it Moses said to Aaron what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them. Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire. And out came this calf. Father, please be with us now as we learn from your word. Uh, we are eager to hear from you this morning. May you truly be a blessing to us as we pause and hear you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone, meet Elsie. <laughs> she is our black Labrador. She's just about to turn two. And she's your typical lab. She's full of energy and she loves her food. <laughs> He's the biggest fan. However, Elsie has a strange phobia. 
And we had no idea what this was all about until I was out walking here one day. If you know where we live, we're walking down Fox Street, down to Meldrum Park, along that bike track. And, you know, walking along as she normally just gives a bit of a pull as she goes along. And all of a sudden she goes skitchy. She goes left to the right. She goes everywhere. She's pulling away. And we're like, what are you doing, <laughs> stupid dog? And the only thing I could really notice at the time was just the smell of smoke in the air. And we got 20, 30 metres down the track and she was happy. She was like back to normal. I was like, I didn't put two and two together initially. And then went to the park and came back. Again, she goes, same spot. Oh, skitchy. Left, right and centre. And I'm like, okay, smell of smoke. Okay, weird. Let's keep going. And we thought nothing more of it until we went to our family farm up at Old Bonalbo, put the Billy T on, put the fire going. And here's Elsie going, going, hiding away from the smoke. You know, the smoke is changing direction every five seconds. And she's trying to avoid the thing. And I'm like, what's wrong with this dog? <laughs> and, and it's still with her now. Like we've, we've, we've done a little bit of research, but we're just not sure what really has brought it about. Like we remember the day we picked her up from the farm near Lismore. It was in the middle of 2019 and it was just smoky. It's because of all the bushfires. It wasn't just smoky that day, it was smoky for like five months straight. You probably remember that. And I wasn't sure if it was anything to do with the smell of smoke and being taken away from her mum, I don't know, but it's just, and whether it's the same thing for the rest of the litter. But even now, you know, she's still got this smoke phobia. And every time it happens and you, you know, you smell it and it happens and you got to re really restrain, I got to really restrain myself and not get angry at her. Like, silly dog, just be normal, will you? Don't have to worry about smoke and, you know, why can't you be a camping dog, you know? <laughs> I just wanted to lie around the campfire and just be relaxed, but no. <laughs> and I guess we can read the passage we just read and go, what is with these silly Israelites? What's with these people? What are they doing? They've uttered the miraculous. They've, they've seen the miraculous take place. The Red Sea's parted and they've walked through. And they've seen water pour out of rocks and, and just crazy miracles happen. And they're, they're still, we look at these people and go, what is wrong with them? And then we can fast forward and maybe even look at, as they're at the edge of the land and they're not willing to go into the land. And we're like, what is wrong with these people? And maybe we might even think that in our pride, thinking, what is wrong with these people? And yes, there is something desperately wrong with these people, but let us not just jump on the bandwagon and condemn Israel without first seeing, oh, is that same guilt hiding in us as well? There's a high likelihood none of you here have worshipped a golden image, although I can't say for sure, uh, but we're all guilty of worship. Right? We've all worshipped something. We worship something still. It may be God, but it may be something else. Tim Keller wrote in his book called Counterfeit Gods, in his introductory section, he makes the argument that when you have an ultimate source of meaning or hope, and that ultimate source of meaning and hope is taken away, this is what breaks a person's spirit and brings them to nothing. During the week, I had a co-worker, he came back in the office and he's all bright and cheery and my boss looks at him and goes, what are you bright and cheery about? And he's like, I'm alive and I live in paradise. No. Yes, you are alive and yes, because you live in Lennox Head, you live in paradise. But I couldn't help but feel a bit melancholic, I guess, on his behalf and go, well, you know, one day your life is going to run out and then what are you going to have? Sorry, it might sound morbid, but um, I just had to feel that just because, well, the only hope there is, isn't there, is eternal life. Might have life now, but real life is life in God. Tim Keller also said this in his book, Each culture is dominated by, his, by its own sets of idols. Each has its priesthoods, its totems, its rituals. 
Each one has its shrines, whether office towers, spas and gyms, studios or stadiums, where sacrifices must be made in order to procure the blessings of the good life and ward off disaster. Young women today are driven into depression and eating disorders by an obsession concern over body image. Money and career are raised to cosmic proportions where we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. When we take a look at Israel and the Golden Calf, we could potentially go forth and observe more about them and look at their refusal to enter the Promised Land, as I mentioned before, and see a people who have been shaped by their past. They've been shaped by a host culture. Remember, two to three months before this happened, they were, all of them, their whole lives, were slaves. Harsh slavery was all that they knew. The cruelty of captors. And it's perhaps the reason why we see such hardness boil to the surface when anything that tests them takes place. And yes, there are over a million of these Jews who have escaped Egypt, but they were still part of this host culture. They were not unfamiliar with Egyptian gods. They were somewhat shaped by this culture they were already living in, that they had spent their whole life in. And as much as they were obedient to keeping the Passover, as much as they were willing to plunder the Egyptians and to head out in victory, it seemed that they took more of Egypt with them than they may have thought and realised. And I think one of the central lessons we can learn from this story is the effect of the imperceptible effect of culture upon all of us, how we think and how we act. What we've seen in Exodus so far is a people living in a host culture, ripped out of that culture and encouraged to live a new culture, a culture defined by God, a culture defined by faith, a culture about doing what God wants you to do. Don't do the sin that you did before. Focus on God and doing what God has asked you to do. And it's a new way of thinking. It's a new way of getting their brains working a different way. And remember, it's only two to three months since they were in that Egyptian mould. And they, even along the way, they say, yes, God, when they hear God's words and, and God says, will you promise to keep my word? They say, yes, we will keep your word. We will do what you ask. But we see the inevitable effect of what happens when people are given an option to tr do something new or do something that's comfortable. We gravitate back to what's comfortable, right? We gravitate to what is normal. What feels more at home to us? And what felt more at home for them is gods you could see, gods you could bow down to. They saw it left, right and centre in Egypt. And the Egyptian gods were not very different to any other pagan set of gods in, that da in those days. They were either related to nature, natural phenomena like the Nile River or even animals like we see with frogs and cows and different things. One of the gods of Egypt was Apis. I think there's a picture of it on the screen there. Um, who was a fertility god in the form of a bull. And there's conjecture as to whether this was the god that ultimately influenced the golden calf to be made. But what we find when we peruse and look closely at the passage is that God doesn't allow culture to be an excuse for disobedience. As soon as the whereabouts of Moses is put under question, we see the very first thing the people ask. Up, make us gods. And as Aaron requests that they provide the gold for this God on their very ears, we see this whole concept rise again of people exalting themselves, people worshipping the works of their hands as the same flaw that that Cain fell into when he brought all the produce of his crops and brought for God and said, God, look at the beautiful work of my hands. You must accept me now. But God didn't. It's the same trap 
that the people at the Tower of Babel fell in as they, with the works of their hands, built a massive tower to get to heaven. But it would always fall short. And if making a golden calf wasn't rebellious enough, they cry out these terrible words in verse 4. These are your gods, O Israel, who what? They brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What blasphemy? How dare they declare that another little God brought them out of the land of Egypt? They're taking away the glory from the true God. And we see the utter de devastation of this in verse 7, where the Lord says to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. What's going on here? The people essentially disown God, and God seems to disown them. They're your people, Moses, not mine. Indeed, an absolutely tragic set of circumstances. What makes this even more terrible is that these people have already covenant with God. They've pr promised to keep God's law. It's already been done. And maybe we as people who are under a new covenant by the blood of Christ, maybe should even take heed even more. We are just as susceptible to, of letting culture around us affect us instead of letting God and his intended culture lead us. And just like with the people of Israel, following God is not the culture that comes easiest to us. What is easiest for us? It's to fit into the crowd. It's to remain invisible so that we're not ridiculed. So that we're not ridiculed is not directed our way by the people around us. But what is the culture God wants us to adopt? Well, simply this. It's what he says in his word. You know, what he writes down and what we read and we obey it. That's the culture that he wants. Christians in Australia today are drawing influence either from the culture around them or from what we read about what God has shown us and intends for us to live through his word. And both, both of these things could be happening at the same time. That's the thing. We could be drawing from the Bible, yes. We could be drawing maybe imperceptibly from the culture around us. And the danger is... Are we drawing from our culture around us things that the Bible says otherwise about? If we're truly following Jesus, he's the centre of our worship. But if we're following the surrounding culture too much, we find that we're worshipping the idols of our culture in place of God. And we can often be like Israel. One moment we're delighting in God and praising him and thanking him for his grace and mercy. The next, our eyes are set on things here in the world. A bit like that Xbox, I guess, from the story. And then the hard truth be becomes that we become like the church in Laodicea. Where we're neither cold nor hot. And what happens then? We get spat out. The warning given to the church at Laodicea. Let's read from Revelation chapter 3. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realising that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. There's the lesson. And there is the promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. What's this calling for? It's calling us to be all out for God, in other words. Completely sold out to Him. Another quote by Tim Keller is this. 
An idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. Therefore, anything can be an idol. The idols of our culture are many, and I would have time to only cover a certain amount. Call of hands. Who's done the reform course and read through the material all the way through? A few of us? <coughs> Who's got sort of part of the way through? You don't actually have to get th- very far through to perhaps see this next diagram. In the book, there was a, this list of potential idols for us to, uh, to identify. Not just potential, but maybe they might hit hard being fair dinkum idols in our lives. And maybe this list covers a good majority of the idols in our lives. Maybe there's more. I think there's definitely more. It doesn't mean that sport is bad. It doesn't mean fashion is bad. It doesn't even mean that uh, body image is bad. Maintaining a good weight is better than being overweight, of course. It's when these things consume us that when we lose them, we are broken people. Sport, having an unhealthy appetite for the consumption of your favourite sport, as if it's unthinkable to miss out on the dragons playing every weekend. Following the state of origin, as if it's life and death. Fashion, having an unhealthy appetite for always having to look fashionable every time you step out of the house, as if it's unthinkable to do otherwise. About power, having an unhealthy appetite for ordering people around and making decisions that affect the masses, as if it's unthinkable that anyone else had the ability to make similar decisions or to order you around. How about significance, having an unhealthy appetite for people depending upon you and your input into things, as if it's unthinkable that you wouldn't be a critical component on any critical process you're involved in. How about comfort? having an unhealthy appetite for everything, being super cushy and cosy in life, as if it's unthinkable that hardship would ever enter into your world. Body image, having an unhealthy appetite for looking good, having the socially acceptable curves and posting too much on your appearance on the socials, as if it's unthinkable that people do not comment on your Insta or Facebook posts with, looking good, hun, so beautiful. Materialism, having an unhealthy appetite for things you can see and feel, cash in hand, latest furniture and appliances, as if it's unthinkable that the latest from West Elm or Smeg are not perpetually in your home. Approval, having an unhealthy appetite for receiving the thumbs up from everyone based upon who I am and what I do, as if it's unthinkable that anyone would not rate the things you do. There's one that hits home for me most. Independence, having an unhealthy appetite for doing everything without any outside help, as if it's unthinkable that other people can help you to function and live out life. Money, ooh, what a big one. Having an unhealthy appetite and obsession for the comfort of a big bank balance, as if it's unthinkable that I would even know financial hardship and needing to rely on others for a helping hand. Let me add a couple more that aren't on the list. Substances. Having an unhealthy appetite for a substance that makes you feel relief from pain and suffering and stress, as if it's unthinkable that I don't drink tonight and feel all my stresses just float away until this time tomorrow when I do it all over again. And perhaps all the idols mentioned here are sub-idols to one greater idol. Self. The one idol that our culture drives forward is self. You, 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 it's all about you. Having an unhealthy appetite for a bit of everything mentioned on the list and how it just all feeds into your pleasure, your praise, your comfort, your acceptance by all. As if it's unthinkable that something, someone else like God would be the centre of your universe. It's probably the biggest idol in our Western world, self We exist in a culture that believes that life, 
that our lives consist of whatever we make it to be. We've observed it a million times over, haven't we? People just live life for themselves. When it comes to the end, what is the good of self? What is the good of the idol of self? When everything is said and done, when history has been rolled up like a scroll, what are we left with? We can learn a lot from Moses, who gives glory to God for their rescue from Egypt. Verse 11 in Exodus 32 says this, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? We see Moses directing glory back to God. Because he knows that his dependence is fully on God and only to be given to God. When it's all been said and done, we have God left over. And so I would propose this. Why should we pour any of our energy into depending upon anything else? Upon pleasing these other idols in our lives when all that's going to be left anyway is God. If we know that God is the sum total of what is left over, then since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin and idol which so clings closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12. If we are to foster a Christian culture that looks different from the outside but is such a rich and satisfying way to live then we need each other's help in this it's why we have to have to prioritize christian communities so that we're fostering a culture that is i guess christians it's based upon god and his what he says We foster this culture among ourselves that becomes a culture that brings more satisfaction, that brings more security, that brings more significance to our lives when compared to the worldly culture around us and perhaps even allowing this culture to develop that the outside world looks into and they see, wow, they've got security in who they are. They find their significance not in themselves but in something far more solid and as Phil was sharing last week we do church week by week missional community together DNA in person or in zoom Monday morning prayer a Friday morning prayer on zoom having a group chat on telegram not just because they're good ideas but we want Christian community and culture with one another and perhaps even this culture that is even something that our kids would love to be a part of as they see the world culture around them and they see the Christian culture we're trying to have here now in, as a body that they might look upon the church body and see the culture in that and go wow yeah I actually want to be part of that and wouldn't it be great if it's the love of Christ shared between one another within the body that other outsiders see and are drawn to. And we're seeking to do this at the same time as having to live with the fact that very few of us live close to one another. It's, it's, you can't avoid it, you know. We're, we're scattered abroad. We're scattered abroad this town and some of us here are scattered abroad, Lennox and Teven and Lismore and beyond. We can't, we can't help that. We have to live with that. But at the same time, Ephesians chapter 4 speaks about we growing in our maturity as Christians as a body. We do it together. We, we do it so much slower on our own. And it's one of the challenges of the post-lockdown world of COVID. Everyone feels like they can do it on their own. And they try to do it on their own for a while. And it's been such a big problem for many churches, including ours, I think. Many who are in our churches have not come back to community. 
what does this community ultimately achieve? I think it goes a long way to helping us avoid anything that looks like the tragedy of Exodus 32, to avoid the self-destruction of our faith. In community, we encourage one another, setting our eyes back on Jesus, encouraging one another to do that. Yes, you're struggling, but just keep your eyes on Jesus. It's what we do with one another, even to pray for one another. And as the culture around us champions success, success as Christians, I believe, is showing weakness to one another. And how do we do that? By saying, please pray for me. I'm struggling to let go of the idol of approval. Can you please pray for God's intervention and deliverance? I'll put it out there, I guess as an elder of this church, and go, look, I'm going to be weak in front of you all. As an example, I need you to pray for me, because this is a real struggle. I'm consumed by what people think about me. Maybe you already knew that from our DNA group, but for those who aren't involved, there you are. I struggle with that all. The idol of self leads us to make sure we're all scrubbed up and clean on the outside, keeping our sin under the surface. And I think that's been a chronic problem for the church for a long time. But bringing our issues, our sins, our struggles to the light, talking about why we hold certain things as idols instead of looking to God, I think this is what we need to do, is to be brave, but to have confidence and trust in one another. Because you know what? We're not so different to each other. What's it all boil down to? I need you all. <laughs> and you all need... No, not me. You need Christ, but you need others who are alive, that who he's alive and in and through. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this word. Lord, we are so, so keen to be people who do not ever experience something like the Israelites did in the passage we read today. We long for you, but sometimes, and a lot of the time, we get distracted from by the world around us. Lord, we love the people in the world around us, and in many respects we do love parts of the culture there good things about it but Lord we we want to follow you we want to follow you and the, and the and the being the blessing that it is then the hope that is shown in through being a community together oh Lord you know we it's often easy to talk about but hard to implement and Lord give us help maybe baby step by baby step help us to get there help us to be people who are vulnerable to each other saying I'm struggling with this Lord help us to be a praying church one that loves to pray and loves to bring each other to your to your throne Lord and so so Lord I pray for this help us to be one together as much as possible with Christ being in us the hope of glory